the Stuarts, a bloody reign is an evocation of the extraordinary era when these four Stuart kings lived through turbulent times. Catholic versus Protestant. Parliament against King. The English Civil War. Europe torn apart by religious conflict. The plague, the Great Fire of London, and finally, a Catholic king fled his country and his throne. James II, the Catholic king of a Protestant country, was a disaster waiting to happen. The Stuarts' reign had begun with James I, then Charles I. Their belief in the divine right of kings ultimately led to their downfall. At the Restoration, Charles II became a popular, if outrageous, monarch. The kingdom remained simmering with Catholic versus Protestant sentiment. King James II was a last, desperate attempt at a Stuart monarchy. I think history is very tough on James II. He was a very brave, headstrong figure, a very good soldier, very good admiral. But unfortunately, being so pig-headedly Roman Catholic was the undoing of him. He goes on an all-out, very rapid process of Catholicization. This completely wrecks the popular base of, of his power that he'd enjoyed in his first year. He was in some ways a very competent person, but he threw it away for no particular reason, but it was absolutely extraordinary. James II just thought he was going to do his bit as a Catholic king, and it went spectacularly wrong. Charles II died on the 6th of February, 1685. He had ruled over England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland for a quarter of a century, following the restoration of the monarchy after the collapse of Oliver Cromwell's Commonwealth. Charles had converted to the Catholic faith on his deathbed, and he would be succeeded by his younger brother, King James II, a man who had been Catholic for nearly two decades. In a country that was now officially Protestant, this was a grave concern. James II's reign would not last long. In this series, we've examined the reign of the four Stuart monarchs through the lives of the Wynne family, who lived here at Gwydir Castle in North Wales. The Wynnes owned hundreds of acres of land surrounding the castle, and they prospered enormously during the Stuart era. It all began with John Wynne, who inherited the Wynne estate in 1580 during the reign of the earliest Stuart monarch, King James I. John would be knighted, and the family would be honored with the title of baronet. During King Charles I's reign, Gwydir was overseen by John Wynne's son, Sir Owen and Sir Richard. It was at this point that the connection between the Wynne family and the ruling Stuart dynasty was strongest of all, as Sir Richard Wynne was a close personal friend of King Charles I. But then, civil war broke out, and the king was beheaded. Sir Richard Wynne never recovered and died Charles. just a few months after he witnessed his friend and king being publicly executed. Sir Owen Wynne had to care for the estate with his wife, Lady Grace, during the challenging period of Oliver Cromwell's rule. With the restoration of the monarchy and the return of King Charles II, the Wynnes would prosper once again, this time with Sir Owen's son, Sir Richard Wynne the Younger, back in the restored royal court. However, Sir Richard Wynne the Younger had no male heirs, meaning the estate passed to his daughter, Mary, known to everyone as Mally. Along with her grandmother, Lady Grace, it was her job to maintain the Wynne estate in the new era of the Restoration. Lady Sarah dies of the plague in 1671. She's very young, and then in 1674, at the age of 39, Sir Richard dies as well, so it's too young. And that means that they only have one child, that's the lovely Lady Mary, and at the age of 17, she is suddenly the heiress of a vast estate. Um, and the person who's uh, 
who becomes the sort of grand choreographer of all of this is her grandmother, Lady Grace Wynn, who um, survives um, as the matriarch, this powerful figure of the past. And she brokers marriage deal after marriage deal until she finds the one that is acceptable. And the one that's acceptable turns out to be the young Lord Willoughby Deresby, uh, Robert Barty. Mally married Robert Bertie in 1678, later the Duke of Ancaster, a member of Parliament. The baronetcy that the Wynne family had gained during the reign of King James I could not be transferred to the female line, and so that was given to a junior branch of the Wynne family, and the Berties acquired the Gwydir estate. From that moment, the direct connection of the Wynnes to the land and the landscape and the people of, of North Wales stops because it becomes a secondary estate. It becomes an additional part of the Willoughby Deresby Empire, which was in itself quite huge. They were a Lincolnshire family based at Grimsthorpe Castle. Um, Lord Willoughby Deresby goes on to become um, the Earl and then the Duke of Ancaster and Castevon, so he becomes very important. The Wynne family, once so powerful, was now losing influence and status, and so were the Stuarts. For most of his life, King James II had never expected to become king. He'd been born in St. James's Palace in London in 1633, the second son of King Charles I and his wife, Henrietta Maria. James held the title of the Duke of York from birth. During the English Civil War, he'd been confined by Parliament to his birthplace, St. James's Palace, while his father fought a losing battle with the Royalist forces. At the age of 15, James managed to sneak away from his confines, disguised as a woman, and made it all the way to The Hague in the Netherlands. Continental Europe would be where James would spend much of his life. When his father was executed in 1649, when James was only 16, his elder brother was proclaimed king by the Royalists and the Parliaments of Scotland and Ireland. Charles was even crowned in Scotland in 1651, but the Stuart family was unable to reclaim England and eventually Oliver Cromwell prevailed, becoming the undisputed ruler of a new Commonwealth. Charles and his brother James sought exile in France, their mother's homeland, and it was during this time abroad that James was exposed to the beliefs and the ceremonies of the Catholic religion. As time went by, he was drawn to that faith with greater and greater conviction. James even served in the French army, but France chose to ally itself with Oliver Cromwell. The Stuart family made an alliance with Spain as a result, and James switched over to the Spanish forces and battled his previous French colleagues. James learned to be a soldier and he'd fought first for the French and then for the Spanish. He'd fought for the French until he was driven out of the French army by the treaty by which Cromwell um, allied with France against Spain. But he just flipped over and went and fought for the, uh, for the Spanish side and in fact, uh, in the last of the great battles of the New Model Army, back in the dunes up in France and Belgium, the English armies of Cromwell, one of the people fighting against them was James. He was on the battlefield. James was considered a brave fighter and was on the brink of accepting the rank of Admiral in the Spanish Navy when the collapse of Cromwell's protectorate in England rapidly changed those Stuart prospects. James declined the Spanish offer. Within months, his brother would reclaim the English throne. James returned to London and was soon appointed Lord High Admiral of the Navy. He became one of his brother's closest advisers and was widely praised for his tireless efforts to extinguish the Great Fire of London. But in private, his religious allegiances were shifting. His wife, Anne Hyde, had converted to the Catholic religion almost as soon as the couple had returned to London. By the late 1660s, James had converted as well. 
we now know that James was formally received in the Catholic Church in 1668. He continues to attend Protestant services for a few years, but news about his, his going you know, privately to Catholic Mass, Catholic confessors and so on, was, was leaking out. And by 1676, James comes out. So then you have a crisis that the heir to the throne is going to be a Catholic. Therefore, there is a huge political campaign to prevent it. Well, I think history is very tough on James II. We tend to forget all about him except the disaster of his three years as a king. He was a very brave, headstrong figure. He was a very good soldier, very good admiral, and had fought bravely, and he, he had a lot of qualities. But unfortunately, being so pig-headedly Roman Catholic was the undoing of him. Sixteen seventy-three was a critical year in the life of the future King James II. His first wife, Anne Hyde, who converted to the Catholic faith long before him, died in sixteen seventy-one, and James was about to marry his second wife, Mary of Medina. Sixteen seventy-three was also the year of the Test Act. This was a penal law voted in by Parliament, and it required all civil and military officials to take an oath that declared their allegiance to the Anglican Church. James was in an impossible position. He couldn't betray his principles and make such an oath. He refused, resigned as Lord High Admiral. Well, there had been rumours abounding that he converted to the Catholic faith and he was now married to a Catholic bride from Italy. Those rumours now seemed confirmed by James' refusal to make that oath required by the Test Act. The difficulty with James II was everyone knew he was Catholic. Uh, it was not something he could hide, and not something he wanted to hide either. Um, I mean, obviously, when push came to, to shove at the Test Act, he had to just resign his commission as Admiral. And that meant he was okay, because he didn't have to do any signing, he didn't have to do any oathing. The fact that James's elder brother, King Charles II, had no legitimate heirs with his wife, Catherine of Braganza, that meant James was next in line for the throne. He became the focus of numerous conspiracy theories. Many suspected there were plots to assassinate Charles, replace him with James. Anti-Catholic sentiment rose again across the country. Fairly soon after the test acts and the sheer scale of the number of people who resigned, which took people by surprise, they had no idea they would have so many people who were secret Catholics. And the great anxiety of what will happen if a Catholic does become king, you begin to get people who started to claim that there was a conspiracy at the top of government to assassinate Charles to hasten James's accession to the throne. So this is called the Popish Plot. And the claim that there were, that there were a large number of people who were conspiring to assassinate the king. And that if James didn't know about it, he was turning a blind eye to it. And in any case, he was the beneficiary of what they were doing. And the way to prevent the assassination of the king and the succession of a Catholic ruler was to pass an act that would mean that the Catholics couldn't, couldn't benefit from the assassination. I mean, if there was a law which prevented a Catholic successor, there's no point in killing the existing king, particularly one who had been fairly lenient, you know, in his attitude to the Catholic population. To soothe the worried public, King Charles II arranged for James's daughter Mary to marry the Protestant William of Orange. James reluctantly consented to the match. The marrying of, of William of Orange, who was of royal British blood and therefore had a potential claim, to James's elder daughter gave a, a potential focus now for those who were just not prepared to tolerate a Catholic king. This was not enough, however, to relieve the growing hysteria in the country and in Parliament. In 1679, the Exclusion Bill was introduced into the House of Commons. If passed, it would have prevented James from inheriting the throne because he was Catholic. The Exclusion Bill was also having an impact at Gwydir Castle. Mally Wynne had married Robert Bertie, Lord Willoughby Deresby, the previous year. He had tried unsuccessfully for election into Parliament. 
Mally Wynn and her grandmother, Lady Grace, eagerly await correspondence from him as unrest spreads across the country at the thought of King Charles II's brother, James, becoming the first Catholic monarch. My lady, my lady. Thank you, Tom. Poor Tal. Are there no others that could deliver your letters, Grandmama? The years on Tal have not rendered him past use. No, I cannot conceive of Gwydir without him. But surely there are others who can share his burden. Master Williams has a son. A boy. He is 19. How fares your husband? Is Robert recovered from his disappointment? He resolves to stand again in the next election, though when that will be. The exclusionists are much in the ascendancy. Even if the bill passes through the Commons, it will fail in the Lords. Oh, I pray it is so. The Duke of York will be king, child. Fool does he be. Oh, Mama. Not in my time, I pray. But does the Duke not abide by his conscience? His principles? Principles? are an o'er-admired thing. I wonder, though, at the exclusionist mind. Can the law alter what God has settled? If Parliament can choose itself a king, why not a tenant his lord? It pulls at society's very order, I fear. I suppose Master Williams can learn the duties of a gatekeeper. They grow. So fast, the young. <laughs> Let us see if we can o'erpace Tal and tell him of his new apprentice. <laughs> the bill bitterly divided the Commons. Indeed, parts of the modern British parliamentary system can be said to date from this dispute. Those who backed the exclusion bill became known as the Whigs. Those against became known as the Tories. The bill was finally defeated in 1681, when it was rejected by the House of Lords. Clearly the failure of exclusion and the revenge which is taken by uh, the regime in dismissing so many with their prominent supporters of exclusion from their, their positions will produce, as it always has in history, you know, some people who overreact and think the, the only solution is to assassinate. Charles and James, there's a lot of talk, there's not at all clear how much action there is to plan to intercept him as he returns to London from the races in Newmarket. But in fact, they return early, and so the plot hadn't matured. But when you have plots, there are always people going to betray them because you can't make a plot work without a lot of people knowing. And if a lot of people know, it's increasingly likely somebody will know who will betray it, and that's what happens. The botched assassination attempt on the Stuart brothers in 1683 provoked a wave of sympathy for James. Several Whig opponents were implicated, and James's position was strengthened further as a result of their fall. The Catholic Duke of York would indeed be king. King James II was crowned on April the 23rd, 1685, but almost immediately he faced a rebellion from his own nephew, the Duke of Monmouth. Monmouth was the eldest illegitimate son of King Charles II. He proclaimed himself the true king in Lyme Regis in Dorset, and his Monmouth rebellion attempted to overthrow King James II. Here at Gwydir, the situation was followed especially closely because Mally's husband, Robert Bertie, was a captain, I was now fighting on behalf of King James in the attempt to swiftly crush the rebellion. It gives me great joy, dear husband, to hear of your efforts in London and the Commons on behalf of our new king. There is great rejoicing here at Grimsthorpe as well. This Sunday gone, the parson even read from the pulpit His Majesty's words, which I thought very fine and noted well. I shall make it my endeavour to preserve this government, both in church and state, 
as it is by law established, as I shall never depart from the rights and prerogative of the Crown, so I shall never invade any man's property. The parson gave it much import, the word of a king being more secure by far than any mutable law. Lord Willoughby Darrisby is holding office under James II, but also, interestingly, he's captain of a troop of horse under King James, fighting uh, at the Battle of Sagamore in 1685, so against the Duke of Monmouth and the Monmouth Rebellion. That's very interesting. The Monmouth Rebellion was quickly dealt with, as was another rebellion in Scotland that occurred at the same time, known as Argyll's Rising, led by the Earl of Argyll. These two rebellions had been coordinated together, but neither of them were able to drum up enough volunteers in the end. Both the Duke of Monmouth and the Earl of Argyll were captured and executed. The rebellions were put down with ease, but they deepened James's insecurities. He strengthened his army and put loyal men in charge of the regiments. This might have eased his worries, but the actions caused alarm in Parliament. A standing army of such size was not a tradition and many of the chosen commanders were Catholics. This placed Mally's husband, Lord Willoughby's position as captain, under threat. Are you in there, boy? Forgive me, my lady. Thought it was young Williams. I can have these chambers readied. No, no. Well, perhaps just the fire. Tal? Yes, my lady. Will you not sit a moment? Well, I know you did so with my grandmother from time to time. Perhaps in her memory? And how is Master Williams proving? Uh, tardy. <laughs> Often in need of a bath. <laughs> I can see why you and my grandmama got on so. You were a soldier, were you not? For the martyred king. We have always been loyal servants to the Crown, this family. My husband's likewise. He's been turned out of his employment as captain. And the King is displeased with the militia. <laughs> he desires a standing army, with officers he can trust. Though Robert led a troop of horse against Monmouth in 85, he is not of the Popish faith, nor are his brothers. The King has cleared the army of our whole family. I am sorry, my lady. We were only ever loyal. But our hope for advance now seems quite remote. The gunpowder plot of 1605 has seemed like a last desperate attempt to return a Catholic monarch to the throne. But now, with King James II, the seemingly impossible had happened. The new King's royal court was soon dominated by Catholics. A representative from Rome was welcomed for the first time since the days of Mary I, over a century before. In May 1686, James sought a ruling from the courts to show he had the power to dispense with acts of parliament. He fired judges who disagreed with him. The following year, he made a new declaration of indulgence, announcing religious toleration, including for the English Catholic minority, and ordered it be read from every pulpit in the land. The man thought to be the instigator of the Declaration of Indulgence was William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania and member of a new religious movement that had arisen during Stuart rule, Quakerism. Penn went on a tour of the country to promote James's Declaration of Indulgence, but it was fiercely resisted by the Anglican clergy. James overplays his hand. He wants to give Catholics a lot of power so that they can demonstrate they can use it responsibly, so that they can show they can be Catholics who will live in peace with their Protestant neighbours. So he goes on an all-out, uh, very rapid process of Catholicization of local government of the civil service. He's determined to reverse the penal laws. He's got to find people who will do his bidding who are Protestant. And so the Anglican establishment are pushed aside and lots of Quakers and Presbyterians and others are pressed into service to be nominated to Parliament. And he changes the conditions of elections in towns so that the town councils will elect 
MPs are not the general electorate. He narrows the franchise. And then, of course, he himself nominates the people who will be the town councillors. It is an extraordinary, extraordinary thing. And he calls in every single existing MP one by one and asks them if they will support the repeal of the penal laws and the test acts. And they all say no. So he has to go to these even more desperate lengths. And uh, this, this um, completely wrecks the popular base of, of his power that he'd enjoyed in his first year. The Archbishop of Canterbury, along with six other bishops, defied the king's orders. The seven bishops, as they were known, were soon arrested, taken to the Tower of London. But their acts of resistance galvanised the public in an unexpected manner. The bishops were eventually acquitted at their trial, and this meant jubilant scenes up and down the nation, embarrassing the king. With each passing month of his reign, James seemed to mimic and exceed the example of his executed father more and more. His attempts to rule as an absolute monarch were being fiercely resisted. His reign, that had started with enthusiasm, general goodwill, was coming to a crashing end. I think he believed it was his duty as a Catholic prince to push forward the Catholic agenda in this country. He strayed into parts of life that were very threatening to the establishment. Um, he got involved in the election of, of fellows at Magdalen College, Oxford, and it became a cause celeb with uh, people having to, very important, influential people being put into prison because they disagreed with him. And at the end of the day, I think he thought his powers as a monarch were greater than they were. He hadn't taken on board the lessons of the civil wars, the fact that the Stuarts weren't able to just behave as they wished. On the 10th of June, 1688, King James and his wife, Mary of Medina, had a son. According to the rules of primogeniture, this child was due to inherit the throne but James already had two daughters from his first marriage, Mary and Anne, and they'd been raised Protestant according to the wishes of King Charles II. The people just about tolerated James's pro-Catholic rule because they knew his only possible successors were his Protestant daughters. But now, with the baby, there was a real threat of a permanent Catholic dynasty. And to many in the church and across the country, this was simply unacceptable. And there's another pretty intriguing twist to this story. The child born to King James II and Mary of Medina was rumored to be an imposter. The story went that the royal baby was still born and another child was smuggled in to replace him and ensure a Catholic succession. When James II's second wife, Mary of Modena, had a son, even that wasn't enough. I mean, clearly that boy should have been king in the, in the, the law of succession. But the Protestant establishment managed to say that the baby had been smuggled in in a bedpan. It wasn't really uh, the rightful heir to the throne. And there was a ready-made heir in William and Mary and their line. King James II knew he had a problem on his hands. He published testimonies of numerous witnesses who'd been present at the birth of his son. He also made plans to pack the next parliament with his supporters and cement his grip on power. But then news reached him of a fresh challenge to his authority. William of Orange, the husband of James's Protestant daughter Mary, was coming to England with an invasionary force. What became known as the Glorious Revolution had begun. They persuaded William and Mary that they were being cut out of their lawful rights by this tended child, and they should come to England to insist on their rights to a full public inquiry into the legitimacy of the new Prince of Wales. Um, and William is willing to do that because William is fighting an all-out war against Louis XIV, and he desperately wants English resources. He wants English troops and, above all, English money. Now the contender was William, who saw England as a very, very useful ally, particularly its wealth and its navy, in his perpetual battle against Louis XIV's France. 
So that's why he was prepared to do it. It wasn't out of any great pride or whatever. It was purely practical. He wanted to have the English on side against France in the great struggle uh, against the Catholic king. William of Orange certainly had pedigree. He'd been involved in several battles with the Catholic King of France, and he was seen across Europe as a staunch defender of the Protestant faith. His armada of 463 ships carried 15,000 fighting men across the Channel. William landed his forces at Torbay on the 5th of November, 1688, 83 years after Guy Fawkes' attempt to end the rule of Stuart kings had failed Another attempt on another king, James, was about to begin. And this time, it wasn't going to fail. The Glorious Revolution is sometimes known as the Bloodless Revolution. While that's not literally the case, it certainly was very low on casualties. When William of Orange's forces arrived on the English coast, the army of King James II that they were up against was twice the size. But William knew he had support among the English, and his strategy was perfect. He had gathered enough finances during his preparations for the war to pay his soldiers for three months in advance, meaning they were happy to delay any battle. William's patience paid off, as James's troops soon started to defect an anti-Catholic riot spread across the land. The brief reign of James II was collapsing, and he knew it. Lord Willoughby Deresby advised his wife Mally to seek refuge in the relative safety of Bridia Castle as support for William of Orange was spreading. No running, Elizabeth! What did I say? Uh, how long will my lady and the children be in residence? As long as my husband deems it necessary for our safety. A general insurrection, is it? How do you perceive the local sentiment? The king jailed our Lord Bishop. Some might mark that in his favour, others less. But do you detect any general inclination? He ought not to have done it, my lady. My husband is for the Duke of Orange. He marches on York with his brothers, and his uncle stays at court so the family can claim loyalty should the enterprise go awry. But what then of Robert? Any letters come, I shall have them brought at once. Day or night. James's real problem lies in the fact that he's relying on certain loyalties that are no longer intact. His own children, the two daughters, Mary and Anne, have been persuaded to put their Protestantism above their duties as daughters. And this, of course, is a devastating blow to James when he finds this out. And also, some of his finest generals have made it clear that they will fight against the king rather than for him, um, including John Churchill, who becomes the first Duke of Marlborough who had been really the instrument who had defeated Monmouth at the Battle of Sedgemoor three years earlier. Maybe it was because he was a Protestant and he couldn't bear to help a Catholic. But James was correct to say that he had taken him from an obscure page boy, given him a commission and helped him on his way. And now this young, brilliant commander was fighting against him. When William arrives, James's commanders are career mercenaries. They're not Catholics. They do what mercenaries always do. They make a calculation on whether they think they're going to win. And James is having some sort of nervous breakdown. Um, he has incessant nosebleeds, which are clearly hypertension. He's clearly behaving irrationally. And I think the professional soldiers, like John Churchill, uh, the future Duke of Marlborough, they look at their commander-in-chief and they think, this is not a guy I want to serve with. To have your daughters side against you in a, in a matter really of life and death and of your dynasty's future. And to have those who you've made from nothing into people of great substance, it must have been devastating on a personal level. But there was always the thought during his remaining years that, well, look what happened to Charles II. He had come back against the odds. So 
We know it never happened, but I, there were a lot of people in England who were playing a double game, um, communicating with James in secret, just in case he did come back, because they didn't want to end up being um, beheaded. They've taken York. The northern nobles are declaring for William. The king marches west to meet the prince with 40,000 men. Though Robert says that number is continually diminished. Whole armies are abandoning the king's cause. Day by day, Prince William's army grows. All seems to be happening with great speed, my lady. Well, Robert is very hopeful. Unwilling to make the compromises that might have saved his reign, James readied himself to flee the country. He ordered his unreliable army to disband. His wife and baby son left for France in early December. And when it came his turn to follow, James petulantly dumped the Great Seal in the Thames. Without it, no lawful parliament could be called. James fled to France to join his family, and William let him go. It is done. The king has fled to France, the queen and the prince of Wales too, with scarce a battle or bloodshed. Will we be making arrangements for your return to Grimsthorpe? We shall. All so well. These knees aren't much after chasing the young ones. They have been most contented here, as have I. King James' escape to France was actually a total farce. The yacht that was meant to take him across the channel was boarded by English fishermen. They'd no idea who he was. They thought he was a Jesuit spy. He was kept prisoner for a week before the uh, misunderstanding was rectified, and he was even returned to London. To William's intense rage, he's brought back by some fishermen in Faversham, so he has to be allowed to escape a second time. And this time, you know, the roads are kept clear and, and the orders are under no, no circumstances find him. So he gets into France and Louis XIV takes him in rather startled at this unexpected defeat he's experienced and sets him up with his own court at Saint-Germain near Paris. Within a matter of weeks, Parliament declared that James had abdicated the throne and left it vacant. William and Mary were declared joint monarchs. Just as the promise of a stable succession had been so important to the elevation of James VI to the throne as James I in 1603, so it was the peace and security embodied by William and Mary that ultimately secured that crown for them. I always view 1688 and James II's exile as the defining moment of the change that started with the outbreak of civil war in 1642, where really the, the, the status of the crown is subjugated to that of parliament. And it's James, because of his three years of intensely unintelligent, prejudiced rule, he brings it to a head finally, so that uh, the, the, the British parliament gets the upper hand from then on. James did not give up. He was planning an attempt to reclaim the throne, just as his elder brother Charles had done. With the help of the French, he landed in Ireland and raised an army to seize back the throne. But he was defeated by William at the Battle of the Boyne in 1690. James fled, never to return to England. I don't think James II was a natural quitter. It was because of the overwhelming evidence that it was over. He just misjudged the central tenet of the Protestant establishment in England, particularly when they looked overseas to France and saw what Louis XIV was doing to the Protestants, treating them with savagery, um, people being broken on the wheel, literally broken on a wagon wheel, or being executed in other ways, or being branded uh, as being Protestants. And 
it was so close geographically and the, the, the thought that it might come across the channel to England meant that there was absolutely no way that what looked suspiciously like Catholic absolutism could be tolerated by James's people. James died in exile in 1701, convinced he'd lost his throne because God had punished him for his adultery. His remains were destroyed during the French Revolution, and so too were his memoirs, meaning that we don't have an awful lot of his perspective, and we've got rather a lot of the opinions of his enemies. James's descendants made attempts to get that throne back. His son, the reported imposter James Francis Edward, became known as the Old Pretender. He started a rebellion in 1715, the Jacobite Rising, and tried to restore the exile Stuart dynasty. He failed. There was another attempt in 1719 with Spanish support, but it was just as ineffective. Then in 1745, King James II's grandson, Bonnie Prince Charlie, made one final shot at the crown. But the country had moved on. King James II was the last Stuart King. The winds span the whole rise and fall of the Stuarts. Sir John Wynne is knighted in 1606, three years after James I came to the throne, one of the very first baronets. Charles I served loyally by Sir Richard Wynne, second baronet. The fourth baronet, Richard Wynne the Younger, was Chamberlain to the Queen of Charles II. The brief reign of James II followed by the glorious revolution in 1688. And then, in 1689, Lady Mary Wynne, the last of the Wynnes, dies. Gwydir Castle's glory has also come to an end. four Stuart men who ruled England, Wales, Ireland and Scotland each wrestled with similar problems. The scope, the nature of government was contested at this time as it never was before. It made their era divisive, often bloody. But the reigns of the Stuart kings saw the beginnings of the modern British state, the unification of England and Scotland, the last death rattles of absolute monarchy and the rise of Parliament as the dominant power in the land.